Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, great to be here um, and to uh, talk with you all uh, today and, and present uh, to you all um, today. Um, I would like to thank Representative Polis for sponsoring the briefing today and also the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine for inviting me to uh, present to you all today. So glad to be here. Um, as was mentioned, um, I run the Division of Population Health at CDC. Our mission is to prevent chronic disease and promote population health and well-being across the lifespan. And as we think about our work across the lifespan, clearly having an impact on the 56 million children who are in school every day for eight hours a day for 12 very important years of their development is an important part of that work. And the nutrition component about what's the, um, offered to children and youth in school is an important component of that work. The U.S. Department of Agriculture School meal standards for the National School Lunch Program is essential to re reversing the rapid increase in childhood obesity and making healthy foods available to children, and that's what this is all about. What I want to talk with you all about in the next 10 minutes or so is a little bit about what the health status is among children, particularly related to obesity. I want to also talk a little bit about what children are currently consuming and what we see in terms of trends in that. And then finally talk about the USDA meal standards and their pivotal role in terms of improving uh, children's health and adolescent health. But before I do that, I thought it might be useful for you all to get a sense of what's happening in one school district across the country. And so we picked Salida uh, School District in Colorado um, as an example uh, in terms of what they are doing here. And they use the school's local wellness po uh, pr policy and, and, and programs to develop and implement a plan to improve the nutritional standards in schools across the district. And so as part of that work, what they were able to do is um, had food staff participate in a culinary apprenticeship program so they could learn how to prepare healthy foods. Also as part of this, the food service director looked at developing novel procurement strategies so that they could obtain healthy pro uh, local produce and local meat as part of their services. They, they, as part of this program, they also wanted to get the young, the children engaged in the process. And so um, had a number of school gardens where <coughs> children grew vegetables and then used those vegetables in homemade soup, soups and salads as part of the work that they were doing. As part of this work, they were also able to eliminate unhealthy a la carte items that were part of the food menu and also in, in re replace them with salad bars. And those salad bars had seven different types of fruits and nine different types of vegetables as part of this. So one of the key theme themes here was increasing the variability in terms of fruits and vegetables that were served. They also promoted drinking water as part of the effort that went on across the district. And now because of this work, middle school and high school students are having servings of salad and fruits in all of their meals across the district. The participation in the school lunch program has actually increased 70% as part of this work. So the number of elementary schools who are participating in the program went from 180 up to two over 300 students participating. You heard about the uh, obesity earlier in the discussion, and I wanted to highlight some data that CDC collects. And this is data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. This is a survey that CDC does now. We do it every year. And we actually measure height and weight of the study participants. So this is actually measured height and weight. We've been doing this survey since the 1960s. So we've got 50 years of data here. And this is looking at youth um, under the age 19 and under as part of the survey. And you can see from 1960, up until today, there's been a fourfold increase in the prevalence of obesity. And you know, we will continue to track what happens in terms of trends and see you know, if what we're seeing in younger uh, children continues or not, and we'll be able to track that 
um, over time. But I want you to realize, even if there are small declines, I think we need to realize that the rate of obesity today in our youth is four times what it was in the 1960s. And I think that is an important take home message for you all as you think about this. I think it's also important to realize that all race groups, all ethnic groups, this is a problem for all income levels. This is a problem for each and every one of our 50 states. Um, and I think that's an important part. The highest rates of obesity among youth are in, in American Indian Alaska Native children, where one out of five of them are obese, and among Hispanic children, where 18% of them are obese. I think the other thing is if you look at rates of obesity in youth, and the states that have the highest prevalence of obesity in youth, seven out of 10 of those states are in the <coughs> southern United States. So just, and those are states that where children tend to eat um, the less amount of fresh fruits and vegetables as well. Um, this talks about the consequences of obesity that I think are important to remember. So children who have obesity are more likely to have elevated cholesterol levels, more likely to have type 2 diabetes, impaired glucose levels, elevated blood pressure levels, but also low self-esteem, social problems, poor self-esteem, sleep problems, and sleep apnea is part of this as well, and orthopedic problems. So back problems, joint problems are all part of this. I think it's also important for us to remember that if children develop obesity, if they develop these risk factors for chronic disease, we know those children are more likely to continue to have those risk factors into adulthood as well. So again, prevention is key for all of this as well. So let me quickly talk a little bit about what kids are consuming. And as was mentioned, I think one of the themes here is that we can, in fact, do better. And we need to do much better. So in terms of meeting national guidelines, our children aren't able to do that. So we're not meeting the national recommendations in terms of eating, e eating daily uh, regular servings of fresh fruits and vegetables. Only 28% of high school students report eating um, one uh, vegetable each and every day. So we've got a long way to go. In terms of recommendations around whole grains, we're not meeting that recommendation either. And then finally, in terms of sodium, sodium students are actually uh, um, uh, consuming more sodium than is recommended. The recommendation is 2,300 milligrams per day of sodium. Um, what children, uh, what boys are um, consuming currently is between 3,000 and 4,000 milligrams. So twice the amount of sodium is what boys are currently consuming. And girls are uh, consuming, on average, about 3,000 milligrams of sodium. So 50% over what is currently recommended. So we've got a long way to go um, there in terms of nutrition. In addition to that, we also know that about 28% of high school students drink at least one regular soda each and every day. So again, a lot to go for. Um, I think a couple of things that I would highlight about this in terms of the school lunch standards, these are based on the 2009 Institute of uh, Medicine report, Building Blocks for Healthier Children, and they reflect the most recent dietary guidelines for Americans. Uh, the standards came out in June of 2012, and schools have time to implement and have three years to implement key components that are in the standards. And for sodium, schools actually have 10 years um, to implement the standards related to sodium. So uh, what's in the new standards incre include increasing the quantity and variety of fresh fruits and vegetables, very similar to the example I gave in the Salida School District, substantially increasing offerings for whole grain rich foods as part of this work, Offering only fat-free and, and low-fat milk varieties is another very important component of this. Appropriate portion sizes and calorie ranges that, that are based on the age of the students. And finally, reducing the amounts of saturated fat, trans fat, and sodium, key components that are part of what's in the standard as well. 
As we think about doing this work, I think another key component that's important as part of this is how do we provide resources to states and school districts to do this very important work. And one of the things that I think is very exciting for all of us in the room is that for the first time in June of 2013, CDC was able to provide resources to all 50 states in the District of Columbia to improve uh, the school environment. And one of the key parts of improving school environments is around the nutrition environment. And so we now have funding that goes to all 50 states. As states think about how to improve the school um, nutrition environment, we are able to provide tools, training, and technical assistance to states and school districts to make improvements in the school nutrition environment, and that includes implementing USDA school meal standards. In addition to that, we've done some nice work with Let's Move, particularly around Let's Move salad bars to schools, which has placed 3,000 300 salad bars in schools across the country um, having an impact on 1.7 million children. The other thing that I think is important about this work is some of our surveillance work, some of our survey work, where we're able to look at sort of how this work is being implemented. And so we have a, we have a study we call School Health Policies and Practices Study that looks at policies and practices that schools are implementing. So we can use that data and we'll, use the, we'll look at the 2014 SHIPS data to be able to see how schools across the country are implementing the new meal standards. The other thing that I think is an important part of this work as well is um, data from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, or YRBS. And this is a survey we do of high school students every other year where we look at health behaviors of those students. And so we will be able with the 2015 YRBS data to look at changes in dietary practices among high school students. And what I hope to see and expect to see is an increase in fruit and vegetable consumption among high school students, and I hope to see a decrease in the consumption of beverages that have low nutritional value as part of this work. Um, so part of what <clears throat> all of this is about and these standards are about are ensuring that students have the energy they need to learn, to be active, and to thrive, and be uh, productive students and adults, that we want to provide nutritionally balanced meals to the 56 million students that are in school each and every day. We feel that these new standards will contribute to reducing the risk of obesity, diabetes, elevated cholesterol, hypertension as well. But the other thing that I think is an important component of this work is this is teaching young people about healthy choices and healthy behaviors. And that is something that they can take across their lifespan. So what these standards include is they include the most comprehensive changes to the school nutrition environment than we have seen in a generation. And we know that schools across the country are interested and want to provide healthy meals to their students. Since the Boston Marathon was this week, two days ago, I thought I would highlight what's happening in Boston public <laughs> schools as another really key example. And here again, similar to Salida, they did a lot of work of getting families and children engaged in the process. And so schools involve students in planting gardens, developing marketing strategies, marketing strategies and taste testing new recipes for menus. So there was a lot of engagement that occurred across the district. Because of that, participation in the school lunch program actually increased substantially um, over the last couple of years. A number of schools that had been doing a la carte items and competitive food um, options for schools stopped doing that and embraced the school lunch program school lunch program that had been operating in a deficit actually saw that deficit reduce over time. And so we're really seeing some nice impacts in terms of Boston. I wanted to end and show you two uh, resources that we have for you that I think are important um, as you move forward. So the first is our Healthy Youth website, which includes all of our tools, all of our trainings, recommendations, it gives examples of what our states are doing, but it's a great resource for you. The other resources are BAM, www.cdc/bam. This is a website specifically targeted <coughs> to youth. 
and there's a whole section uh, in that on that site on um, nutrition and what young people should be doing around nutrition. Nickelodeon, the Disney Channel are shooting, uh, I shouldn't say, um, are, uh, are channeling <laughs> students to young people to that website. Um, and uh, it actually, of all the websites at CDC, it is one of the most popular websites at CDC. So the cdc.gov BAM website is really a neat website. So again, I want to thank you um, for listening to me this morning. I want to thank the congressman for providing the opportunity for me to talk with you today. And I think the last thing that I will say is I think what we need to remember is what all of this is about is creating environments for the 56 million children across this country who want to learn, who want to be healthy, and creating environments so they can thrive. Thank you very much.